My five-year-old recently told me the most beautiful sentence in the English language. Mommy, can I play some Kirby Adventure? Please? His friend has an NES classic, and the boys instantly fell in love with that adorable pink Eldritch blob. Which is great! But my family doesn't own an NES classic, so I decided it was time to set him up with the next best thing. An original Nintendo Entertainment System. Only, ours is prone to blinking and glitches and... Okay. The original NES is a painfully archaic piece of hardware, especially for modern kids. So we quickly abandoned that bad idea and loaded a bunch of ROMs onto an old laptop instead. I even whipped out an NES to USB controller adapter for that added flair of authenticity. And my son loves it. His own computer. It doesn't go online and he doesn't know the login password, but that's okay. It's his own dedicated NES machine and he and his friends think that's just about the greatest toy ever. The only problem is there aren't that many NES games suitable for a short-tempered five-year-old. He still loves Kirby, but around the third level or so he's in tears, accusing the game of cheating him, and I have to intervene before he breaks the 30-year-old controller. But this is a solvable problem. So I went on a hunt for small child friendlier NES and Famicom titles, and I think together my son and I have compiled a pretty solid starter collection of games. Number one. My son loves Bomberman, but he can't help but blow himself up, especially as he unlocks the bigger bombs with the longer explosion patterns. He gets the concept of the game, but his cognitive abilities just aren't up to snuff yet. But that's what makes Karopi and Caroline's Splash Bomb for the Famicom a perfect substitution. The game plays a lot like Bomberman meets Zelda. Kropi the Frog rushes around the dungeon maze, placing bombs and blowing up enemies and obstacles on his path to the dungeon boss. Except instead of bombs, he places water balloons and the blast can't kill him. They just shove him back a bit. With one less hazard to think about, a small child can focus on wetting up the bad guys uninhibited. Plus, it allows for a simultaneous cooperative multiplayer, which is a huge plus for young children who hate taking turns or losing. And the on-brand Sanrio-style graphics are frickin' adorable. Number two. My son refers to Spy vs. Spy as the pranking game. And when he plays against a friend, the two of them just run around the map hiding booby traps and beating one another senseless. They make zero progress towards the end goal, which is to collect a bag of spy paraphernalia and escape to the airfield, but they're too busy murdering each other and giggling about it to care. As a single-player game, Spy vs. Spy is one of the few sandbox experiences on the system. I mean, it's a tiny sandbox, admittedly, but my son loves that he can safely roam around the house playing scavenger hunt. Of course, he doesn't play against the computer. Yet. Instead, I set the game to two-player and just leave the second controller unattended. Without a live opponent to stand in his way, my son has been able to learn the rules of the game at his pace and experience the pride of beating a level on his own. Sometimes it's just more fun to play with a game than to play a game. Number three. In trying to find the perfect kids game, I tried out a lot of duds. The NES is ripe with adorable but deceptively difficult licensed games, or insultingly easy baby toys. Baby's toy. There's very little that challenges a young child without severely punishing them for failure. But I found a perfect balance in Pio Kotan no Dai Maru for the Famicom. Pio Kotan is like a trainer for young gamers. Players control a bunny boy who wanders around the map opening chests. Each chest contains either points, a 1-up, a key needed to pass to the next stage, or a minigame. There's five different minigames in all, and each stage gradually increases their complexity. Between each stage is a no-fail Galaga-style bonus round, and after four stages, the final boss battle. My son was able to complete the challenges at stage one with a perfect score, but by the end of the game he was rapidly losing his accumulated 1-ups. Despite these late-game hurdles, he defeated the boss and beat the game in his first sitting. And because the minigames themselves are so varied and entertaining, it's a title that he will continue to go back to. Heck, even I enjoyed playing it. Number four. Wisdom Tree games have earned a reputation for being kind of terrible. Like, who makes video games based off the Bible? Why would you do that? These games 
If I was God, I'd be p They are generally regarded as hastily made garbage, neither educational nor entertaining enough to qualify as true edutainment software, so including Bible Buffet on this list is sure to raise a few eyebrows. But trust me, this one's actually kind of good. Bible Buffet is a party game. Each turn, the players roll the spinner and move to a space on the board where they're then thrown into a short action challenge. These adventure stages are really short, like two screens tops, and easy enough for a child to complete with some practice. They mostly involve running through the map, dodging projectiles, collecting snacks, and shooting anthropomorphic food items. My kid loves the goofy-looking food-based enemies and insists on gobbling up all the collectibles. And because this game was developed by Wisdom Tree, they had to include God somewhere. Now, I don't know how many killer pizza slices feature prominently in the Bible, but I do know that if the player rolls a book icon on the spinner, they are presented with a religious pop quiz. Well, sort of. Actually, all they're really given is a number and a multiple choice selection. Originally, the game was packaged with a printed book of trivia, and instead of hard coding either the questions or answers into the software, the developers expected players to just consult the book. Consequently, the game is simple to hack. I've been substituting questions about popular video game characters instead. Number 5 The original Legend of Zelda has the reputation now as being the hard one. Certainly not as hard as Zelda 2, but cryptic and lacking the quality of life improvements later implemented by Link to the Past and onward. But a child doesn't know about all that, and can experience the magic of the first Zelda in a way that's been lost to us grown-up fans. We may find burning down all the trees and blowing up all the rocks monotonous drudge work, but kids live for doing the same silly repetitive thing over and over and over again. And when that silly repetitive thing suddenly uncovers a secret cave? Holy poop, Batman! That's video game magic! The NES Zelda holds up today as a relatively forgiving sandbox experience. Death teleports the player back to the center of the overworld, or to the start of the dungeon, but there's no scary game over screen or tangible penalty. In fact, beginning players are rewarded in death by regaining all three of their hearts and thereby their magical shooty sword. My son was getting frustrated with the resonant river jerk that kept sniping him until I pointed this out, and he was totally cool with dying afterwards. Pew pew! Of course, that benefit goes away once the player discovers their first heart container, usually after defeating the dragon in Dungeon 1, but by then the young player will have developed enough skill in the game to play without training wheels. The Legend of Zelda is a low-stakes, casual adventure that rewards curiosity and experimentation, perfect for new players who just want to wander around, kill the bad guys, and collect all the monies. Seriously, my son doesn't want to buy any of the extra equipment because it makes him sad to see his wallet empty. He gets super excited whenever he finds a rupee. Now, that's not to say that these are the only NES video games that my son enjoys. He gets a lot of play out of the Marios, Kirby, and even Zelda 2, but they're still a bit too difficult, and whereas those games cause him much frustration, the alternatives presented on this list allow him to calm down while restoring lost confidence. So, if you're a parent like myself and looking to build a retro library for a young gamer, consider this a starting point and build from there. Not every kid is going to be drawn to the same games, but don't be afraid to search beyond the super popular stuff. You'd be surprised what kids will fall in love with.